Okay, let's start. So today we're doing speciation, um, including hybridization, thus the freaks on the opening slide. All right. Um, but first, a clicker question. Okay, channel 41. Make sure you have this concept down. Well, it's uniform distribution at this point. There we go. Okay, we should talk to your neighbors about this because you're having issues. Try explaining why. And you could draw you could draw it out too. Alright, two more minutes. One minute. <coughs> All right, re-vote or re-answer if you want to change your answer. I advise you to. Okay. Ten seconds. All right, and stop. Okay, so let's work it out. So I start off with A and big A, little B, right? Presume from the example we had last time in class, right? I want to make you think again. All right, and then I say. One species gets A, A, B, B, <coughs> right? And so I've had a, you know, A to A shift, right? Here what do I have to have to have a new allele hasn't seen before? No, we already have big A little right here. Uh, almost. Yes. All right. Which then results in A A B B. All right. And so, <coughs> and so, if you didn't get it wrong, if you didn't get it right, um, welcome to the club. 
happen. Um, okay, do you understand why that works? Yeah, right, so, you know, here, these individuals have never seen a big B allele, these never seen a, a little A allele, and so this might, might, might not be compatible. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's not a dominant recessive thing, just different alleles. Does that make sense? If not, ask questions. Yeah. Right. So if so, with subgenetic molecular compatibility, they're trying to explain how do you evolve such that you can't reproduce with each other? Because back here you could reproduce with each other. Here, how do you go so that this one can't mate with this one successfully, and yet be able to mate all the way through here, and vice versa? And so the the thought thinking is. There is an allele that evolved here that can work fine with big A, but can't work fine with little a. There's never been a selection pressure for interacting with little a. And same thing for um, little a here. It's never been selected for dealing with big B because a new allele hasn't experienced before in history. And so perhaps it could interact fine, but if it can't, you know, it it would lead to this DMI that leads to allow this incompatibility. Is that cool? Yeah. This may be like completely off the wall, like not quite nice, but you have two big A's and then they both mutate the little A's. Like why are why are there two of them on Oh good question. So what's happening here, we think of this through time. Right? So time at this point and time at this point, it starts off at you know one hundred percent big A, right? And here we have little A. And then through time, this start disappears and starts, you know, drifting up. Okay, and so one can gradually get this right out. So at some point in the population, you're 50, you're fifty fifty, right? And you know, this could be through drift or, or selection, right? And of course, the actual curve is not that smooth. The actual curve is something more like, you know, that, right? Make sense? So you're right. It's not that every individual in the population switches to little a. Is that one individual gets a little a allele somehow, and now that little a is in a situation of, you know, at first, a a b b and a a b b, right? And so it can then increase, you know, to have some that have little a, little a, right? And then at some point it can become fixed. 100%. So are we saying this fixation only occurs when that new allele goes to fixation? Uh, not completely necessarily. So if it's still, if it's at moderate frequency, we still have, you know, some meetings when it's still, you know, if I have this individual population, it's still made fine, but if 90% you know, are these, they won't make well. So it still leads to incompatibility, it's not complete incompatibility. Right? And a lot of species can mate and have some offspring that are fertile, but not many. And then we need reinforcement. That make sense? Other questions about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And remember, I mean, these are, so we have, you know, alleles CC and CC and DD and maybe DD here and EE and maybe this one's E and mostly E. Because there's a whole bunch of alleles, right? But only ones that evolve in this particular way can lead to these things. But, but, the, but the point is that there are some that can. And so let's try to explain how we can have this compatibility evolve. So we're just looking at this biased set of the ones that are cool in this way. Other questions about this? Make sense? Okay. Moving on. Okay, so learning outcomes for today. We're going to learn about hybridization, reinforcement, self-incompatibility and diversity, and cytoplasmic incompatibility. So first off, so last time we learned about hybridization, that leads to, you know, freaks of nature sometimes, right? We think hybridization is often a bad thing for species to do, right? If I'm mating with someone outside my species, you know, I'm also going to have lower fitness, so we should probably not do that, okay? Is that always the case? No, that would be full of exceptions. Okay. <coughs> so here we have a case of sunflowers okay, and wide variety of species. And then we have these species 
particular cats will have two parents. Right? If you're a progenitor tree, right, ancestor descendants, but then, you know, so each ancestor can have you know, one descendant or multiple descendants. But here we have something that has two ancestors. How do you get two ancestors? Right. So I have, you know, one parent from this species, one parent from different species, so a hybrid, right? So these species are formed from hybrids of these species. Okay. <coughs> and here we can see them, right? So here's the hybrid one, here's the parent ones. Right? And the hybrids can occur in some pretty cool environments the parents can't occur. So these are sunflowers, right? Little so hybrids occur in sand dunes. Desert floor, salt marsh, and so that has extreme water conditions relative to what the parents can do. Okay. And <coughs> um, we see this to the effect where the hybrid has more variation than the parents can. Okay. There's a reason for that. Okay. So they call it transgressive segregation. Okay. And so let's say you have a bunch of genes for height. Okay. And this one has some genes that have a, you know, a tall allele, and some have a small allele, and have some small, some tall. Okay? So on average, which one's the median? Right? A little taller. But then when they <coughs> hybridize, right, and they have F1, first generation, and F2, I can have, by chance, you actually have having all pluses, some all minuses, some one plus, a bunch of minuses. It's a lot more variation in phenotype and in genotype. Okay. And so if I have this mixture of things that have a positive and negative effect on height or water tolerance and like that, I can have some that are still near the parent phenotype, but some that are much, much taller and much, much smaller. Okay. So assuming that <coughs> overall fitness isn't lower for other factors, right, it would actually allow me to occupy different environments, as you see in the sunflower case. So there's additional variation in the hybrids that allows them to get in different habitats that have you know, lower, lower water conditions than the parent species. Okay, so here, yep. Yeah. I mean, it looks like you can draw the exact same diagram with just kind of the same species with two different mm -hmm. Like, is it just that there's more variation between species that can be hybridized? Is that what Right, so you're right. So you, we could do the same thing in, in two individuals in the population, right? And so we expect evolution to you know, have that variation through time. And so if there is selection for living in salt marsh, then you can move there, right? The thing that hap that's interesting here is that you have that between species, so you don't often have hybridization. But when you do, it can lead to this effect. Good question. Other questions? OK. All right, here's another example in, in animals. So here's an abstract of it. Okay, we can look at the slides later. Okay, but here, the, here's the kicker. Why is this in nature? Right? So in science, you know, you, you go to peer review, you try to publish papers in different journals, and sort of the higher status journals are work that is so cool that you know people in physics and people in biology and people in um, psychology will all care about this cool result. Right? Whereas you know a journal about evolution, that people who like evolution care about, but not people outside. Right? <coughs> and so we see, you know, hybridization between two different animals and fruit flies. It involves a shift in a resource. Okay. So remember we talked about how many insects, you know, eat particular plants and mate on that plant, right? Well, here you have human species that mated, and they're often living in different plants. Okay. <coughs> so here we see the parent species one, parent species two, okay, and showing different alleles they have, gene sites of nuclear and mitochondrial. Right? And then here we see this hybrid right, that has um, some genes from one species, not from some genes from other species. And so it suggests that it's a hybrid based on the genetic information, but also it uses a unique host. Okay. So again, it's like the sunflowers, but instead of going to you know, a saltier environment, go into a different host. And then, since they met on the host plants, that should result in a stately of new species. Make sense? 
questions? Okay. You often see hybrid clines. Okay. So here I have two species of flowers. Okay. One occurs in northern Florida, Georgia. One occurs in southern Florida. And I look at um, so an estimate of you know gene frequencies. Right. I have this mixture that goes through from you know, this kind varying down to this kind. That's an example of a hybrid zone. Why is a hybrid zone interesting for biologists? Why do you care as a biologist about a hybrid zone? Yeah. Right, good. How about in what way? Mm -hmm. right, so, it's just, so for example, if there's just one gene separating them, you have a you know, short time when you have that one gene, and then you know, intermediate, and that's it. If you have a whole bunch of genes separating them, you need to, you know, longer for that to sort out. Yep, that's part of it. Good. What else? Right, so you can see that we found out that you know hybridizations are doing really well here, right? And we're much more commonly expected in these restricted frequencies. There's actually selection for hybrids here, which makes sense if you think of this you know, environment sort of intermediate rainfall from this one and this one. And maybe the hybrids are optimal there. Good. What could happen to a hybrid zone over time? Yep. Okay, so you can speciate, right? So. If, we, if they stop interbreeding anymore, then we'll stop having this hybrid zone. Right? We'll have you know, black, 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 all the way white. And perhaps we'll have the same, these two species in the same area. It's not interbreeding. Right? Okay, what else could happen? Yeah. I guess they could sort of homogenize the black and black work and split all the way up to the white and white all the way back to the black and sort of come back to the Yep, they become one species. You're talking about like the, it's like cyclic that you're doing now. Right? So you could, Merge back to that and one piece back into two. That's one two pieces back into one. Good. What else can you do? I guess if one of the hybrids was like really strongly selected for you could make a lot of different species from hybrids. Mm -hmm. Right, so it could be that you know these hybrids have a unique phenotype that's adaptive, and so this selection for not integrating the current species again. So you could perhaps get reinforcement to have them in a third species. Good. What else do you have? Got some skills. Got some skills. Imagine that balances. Okay. Well, we could just stay there. Just stay stable. Right? So I could have, you know, this gene type is optimal here, this gene optimal here. And you know you have the ones in the middle. And there's not enough selection to get rid of this hybridization, right? So you have this stable hybrid zone for a long period of time. And there's some examples of that. So there's some toads in Europe that have that. Um, there's some grass uh, crickets in eastern United States that have that. So these stable hybrid zones in the same area for a long period of time. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, displacing. What, what do you mean? Possibly, right? So it could be, you know, there's these opportunity daisies in this entire area. That's true. You could also have one other thing you could have is you could have one of the species win, right? So if the black one, you know, has, you know, whatever the black gene is is adaptive in general, it could be sweeping through. And so you can see the hybrid zone moving, right? As this species expands its range, eventually wipes out this species. Okay. And actually, we're worried about that happening in California. So California tiger salamanders. These really cool salamanders that live in um, that some some of them you know stay over stay as adults in water. Some travel across the fields. Um, <coughs> but someone's been introducing other tiger salamanders into California for bait things like that. And it seems that 
the genes being introduced by the new ones are actually better in that environment than the native ones' genes. And so they're actually sweeping through the population. And so the California tiger, tiger salamanders are being outcompeted by this introduced species and also their own hybrids. Okay? And so it's wiping out their genotype for this selective sweep. That can also happen. Is the tiger salamander the black one? Yep. Yeah. This isn't really a question, but like when you take genetics, they always teach you about like the genetics. Mm -hmm. It's just so weird to think that it just blends together all the way. Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah. So we think like you know A and B and Mendelian genetics, um, <coughs> and that's happening too, right? Um, but also you think about quantitative traits, which again, if you look inside, are a bunch of Mendelian genetics, right? But it could be you know we're thinking about you know this, so. This could be, you know, if I have big A, big A, it's plus, if I have little A, little A, it's minus, right? But if I sum them all up, I get this thing that goes from, you know, five minuses to five pluses, so a range of ten, right? And so it looks like a quantitative trait. And so you're right, it could be multiple loci that are involved, but if you look at it, you know, phenotypically, it's a quantitative trait changing. Good. Other questions about this? So we can look at this, what we call this prime, right, in frequency from all one kind to all the other kind. Okay. And one thing you can do is look at how how well, how this commutes through time. You can see in one place with the two B periods that can be the black one and the more common, the white and the more common. Okay. Or you also look to see um, how steep this is. So if this was very steep, what would that indicate? Maybe there's some sort of like stark barrier. Mm -hmm. There could be some stark barrier where there's not a lot of degrees in this one narrow area. Okay. What else? It could also be strength of selection, right? So if there's also selection. Against these intermediate phenotypes, or even genotypes, then you have different species, and then some hybridization to hybrid can be wiped out and then spread. Right? Whereas if you know this hybrid can then move this way and be okay and do that, then it's sort of the shallower, right? I've heard you do it this year as well. And so this is the slow thing about the strength of selection. And so if we have a hybrid zone that seems to be a strong selection, then we move. Radically called the attention zone. Any questions about this? Good. Okay. So, this is not a medieval torture device. Okay. <coughs> this is a, I mean, this is the entire world with some fruit flies. So put the fruit flies in here. Okay. And then we have here different conditions. Right, so this side that has to cover with tape, so it's dark. Okay. This side is higher than this side. Right? And we have different chemicals um, that smell. <coughs> and so what they do is put fruit flies in here and then like, move around. And fruit flies will only make after they find a food source. And the only food is at the ends of these tubes. Okay. So they put the fruit flies in, then they have them find the food. And then they try mating them. Right? And so they'll try mating these ones with these ones. Okay? Generation after generation after generation. Okay? Now initially, you know, flies are one population. What they're trying to do is look for um, disruptive selection. So they took also, also try mating just these with these and just these with these. Right? And then put them all and then put them back in the same camp. We want to see, is there genes that we can use populations? If I'm selecting for this trait and that trait, can I have basically a speciation event based on that selection alone? Okay. There's sort of a, a way of having sympatric speciation in the lab. Make sense? What do you think will happen? We're going to predict what would happen next. All right, so I have, I may, they have these group of flies, and they, you know, they just feed each other, and they feed each other in that same container. What's going to happen?
Well, but, I mean, this is a small enough world that these are all together, so yeah, it would be some kind of trick. Yeah. It won't make. What? People don't want to disagree with that. So we have some some change, but still enough that we could then go back and do breeding studies and figure out what's changing. Good. Well. Okay. So here's what they found. And so here they have um, a marker for eye color, and the business the, the flies start off 50-50 with these two eye color alleles, and so they want to see you know, if you start having a sort of mating, one group and another shifting. The fixation one way, and then the drifting fixation another way, right? And <coughs> um, so bottom's control, right? Where they don't do this sort of selecting; they just pick from a random and have them group. And here they select only certain containers, right? What do you see? What does, what does the plot show? They diverge. Mm -hmm. like they they, 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 they differ. So, you know, the mm -hmm. population of the eye color is have it here and it there. But it's not being selected for eye color. This is a neutral marker that's evolving with them. And so this suggests that when you have this very strong selection for different habitats, you can have, you know, some pattern speciation happen. And looking at more detail, and there is still some gene flow between the populations. Right? Yeah. Except that they're choosing their habitat each generation. So putting them back in the same same bin to start with. Yeah, if you just had them in separate tubes and just kept them in separate tubes the entire time, then it's like allopatry. But every generation I take them, put them back in one tube, and can go find their way again. So in that case, it's like some patrick. Are they two separate? Are they two separate? Are they two separate? Yeah, no, you, you, yeah. Yeah, you, I, you can walk in this tube and at the end of the tube. Okay. Yeah. And that's St. Patrick? Right, that's St. Patrick. But, I mean, isn't it a different habitat? Like it's a different habitat, but you're choosing different habitat. And, and within your lifetime, you can choose to go to any of the habitats. Uh, so right. So I could choose to mate with anyone in any of these habitats. So it would be Alapatrick. Right, and they can't get from one to the other. Or it would take you know, multiple generations to go from one to the other. Yeah, good question. Other questions about this? That's a pretty cool, like, I mean, it's the old school, 1987, I think, 88, right? So, you know, before genomics and things like that, just you know, looking at fruit fly color. And, you know, you can put this in your back half. Right? It's not a huge setup. And even that, you can show some meta speciation. It's kind of cool you can do you know, basic science that way. Okay, so self-compatibility, right? So here I see two pollen tubes growing in the sigma, right? And then pollen is cool because you start growing this long tube down, right? Goes all the way down and up and fertilizes the globules, right? And while it's growing, it's probably maybe half of its genome, genome at that point. So, you know, very indirect, you know, race to get to the end. Right? Um, <coughs> and yet here, 
Some plants recognize the wrong came from their own plant. Okay, because there are multiple alleles, and if you have to have an allele that matches exactly, then um, at some point you stop use. It uh, to destroy RNA. So I have a plan to evolve the system just to make sure it can't reproduce with itself. It's a lot of work. What might that be advantageous? Mm-hmm. As an advantage to outcrossing. Good. Um, wouldn't it be advantageous to integrate it yourself? So like all of you have like, between three and five alleles that if you like made it with yourself, you know, and had you know offspring, it could be lethal alleles in your kids, right? But you that's why we you don't know, mate with our you know our full sibs or you know we mate with uh, we outcross, right? Um, <coughs> and so if you if you self, you might have those and you have lower fitness. Now there are things that do self, right? And what happens over time? Those alleles get purged out, right? But if you've been outcrossing for a while and then start inquesting you have this inbreeding you have this issue. Okay. When am I really advantageous to be able to to self? It's like really hard to find a mate. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to find a mate. As you talked about how anglerfish, right, have those cunular males that have trouble finding, you know, just fit, swim and attach to a female and then just merge as basically an external sex organ for her. I mean, it's so hard to find a mate. And you imagine that some species, it's been hard enough to find a mate they can just have offspring themselves without having to wait for a male to show up. Right? They can have more fitness, they can have offspring earlier, they have more offspring, maybe it's worth it. Okay. <coughs> um, and so, one question is how does this system evolve? So here we have a very simple, why is so, that loop showing up, but where we have self compatible plants and self compatible plants. Right? So these ones, have this mechanism where they can't breed it themselves, these ones can. And each group can have extinction and speciation. Okay? And so the basic model is something like this. Okay? So we're going to start with a bunch of ones that are incompatible. And then sometimes they go extinct, sometimes they speciate, and sometimes they create um, when they're self compatible, they'll also go extinct or speciate. Right? So this is a dynamic system. So <coughs> here, you know, this one you become self-compatible, and in this case, I think there's no way to go back to being self-compatible okay, in this evolution model. So eventually, you become just self-compatible. Okay. And here, you can do both. Yeah. And <coughs> people have done these analyses, right? And found that here is the overall diversification rate. Okay. So. Talk about speciation. We're going to talk about extinction later in the week, right? Diversification is speciation minus extinction. Okay, and normally it's positive, right? Um, you know, if deaths outnumber births, people can go down to having nothing there. Right? Um, but here we see that for the self incompatible ones, the speciation rate is higher than the extinction rate, so this is zero, so they net increase. But here, the self compatible ones have a higher extinction rate than speciation rate. So, why are they still around? Well, these, if, if these are going to extinct faster, right? Why don't they just disappear? Mm -hmm. But you have this right here, right? We're always making. So the self compatible ones are leading to some self compatible ones. Okay, there's a dynamic equilibrium between these transitions and then the future of the Okay. Um, <coughs> and so you get these intervening systems that relate to you know, whether you can agree with self or others. Okay. Any questions about this? We'll cover this more later in the semester, but I want you to get an idea of the self compatibility, self compatibility thing, and how it might evolve and change. All right. So, Haldane's rule. All right. 
So look at this table right, of numbers. You see any patterns. And so again, it's a biological rule, right? So it's not a law, but you look at these and say, oh, that's a cool pattern. So look at this, talk to your neighbors. We sort of pick up from here. So like a mule, it, it can live, but it, um, it could be sterile. All right, so what do you see for a pattern? Someone hasn't spoken yet. Take, take, look at the doctor. What do you see in the pattern? Good. Yep, so look at the doctor. Females, if you have a pattern of mating, females are worse than males. Right? If you have one, if you have one, one that's sterile, so it's going to be a female. If you have only one that's viable, it's going to be a Okay? What about birds? Same, yep, same pattern. Okay. And males? Yep, same pattern. For males and for software. For males and for software. Good. And we know what, yeah. So that so this is a case that would match Haldane's rule, right? There are no such cases in that group, right? So it's not yeah, it's not evidence for it. It's just showing where it would be if it would match. Yeah. Good, good point. Okay. Is there anything about think about why that might be? Are males and females different? What makes you male or female? You're mammals, right? Test chromosomes, right. So, in mammals, males, females, right? What are males, male sex chromosomes? What, what, what are male, what's your genotype? XY, right? Okay, female? XX. Sophila. Same thing. Okay, birds. Anyone know? No. Ah. Yeah, yeah w, exactly. Z W Z Z. Okay. How about lefts? Any guesses? Same as birds, right. Cool. All right. Now I'll give you out why it might be. You can give me a possible explanation. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So exactly. So the header we need accepts in each case, right? So hetero different gamete gamete different ones. So this one, this one, this one, this one, right? Tend to do worse. Okay. Why might that be? Mm -hmm. Right, you have a backup gene, right? So, you have, so females, you know, X chromosomes, you know, have tons of great and useful genes. Right, y chromosomes, right? Um, Part means you're making testosterone. Not a lot of genes there, right? So it's almost like you're having you you know, females have you know two X's and males have basically one X and a little bit of stuff, right? Wherein birds and less, it's the opposite, right? So if you have some, <coughs> um, you know, the DMIs we're talking about, right, between here and here, say, right, well, we have, with females, we have a lot more, we have backup genes and alleles, where males just have the one. Right, so this, have something here, interact with the other chromosome elsewhere, right, here with females you have a backup, with males you don't. Okay, which things leads to, you know, this bias of the heterogeneous sex and issues. There's other mechanisms too, I mean it's biology, it's not just a single thing. Right? Yeah. Right, so canonically it's, you know, in cases of inviability or infertility of one sex is the heterogametic. It tends to be the heterogametic sex. Yeah. Now it doesn't work always. So here we see like, you know, Rosophila, there's still that pattern, but not as strong. I think there's other factors that also affect this too. Uh, uh, when you talk, talk about in the context of hybridization, um, I mean, you can think about it within subspecies and like that, it could also, it could also occur. Um, yeah, and for other, I mean, and yeah, so there are other traits where if it's you know, if it's a gene that has caused a bad effect, if recessive, right, then you have to pick it up much more in the heterogeneous sex as well, right? So, their whole family has also hemophilia, right? So if you cut them, they bleed and they move. And <coughs> that's because of um, genes on the S chromosome, right? And so, females don't have this trait, but they have a second backup, males do. Or um, color blindness, right? So 5% of males are colorblind, a small proportion of females are color blind, so non-zero. Um, and it's because some of the, the color vision genes are on the X chromosome. So females have a backup, two copies, males have this just, just, just one. Other questions? Okay. Cytoplasmic incompatibility. Right? And so <coughs> basically you're looking at you know, plasma between individuals. Right? And it suggests that there is something in the cytoplasm that causes inviability and fertility. Okay. And so <coughs> if I have you know male and female, you know, here, this female is going to be some male offspring, and this male and reverse it and it's offspring like that. Okay. And what you're causing this is a bacterium called Wolbachia. You might see taxa. Okay. And Wolbachia are amazing. So, Wolbachia are passed on the same way your mitochondria are, eternally. Okay? Um, and so, if you're a Wolbachia in a male, right, game's over, you're going to die. Right? Um, <coughs> but, in your population, you have close relatives of yours, right, that might be females as well. Okay? And so, if you can make those ones have a better chance of being passed on, then you'll do better, right? Because you know, an inclusive fitness, right? You're, you, have sh you have many alleles in common. Okay. And so they've evolved such that <coughs> if you have no Obaki or Obaki, you produce offspring. If you have two Obaki of the same type, you produce offspring, right? If the male has Obaki and the female doesn't, then if they make this baby and have no offspring, then they have those that, you know, if the female has Obaki, right, offspring, then, you know, this, this, these ones 
that they're being passed on. Right? Because these ones don't. You know, so, you know, the, the, they're offering us no competitors from these offsprings. Right? And, like, no. and so, it leads to selection for you know, causing sterility to the cases. Mm -hmm. uh, they're host competitors and thereby the competitors of, of their sisters in other hosts. Yep. And so this can lead to speciation the same way that the MIs can lead to speciation. Right? Where, <coughs> you know, if one species gets one strain of Wolbachia, if you see this another strain of Wolbachia, then you know, to strain one, and they make this a different strain, and there's no Wolbachia there, so they create no offspring, and they reverse. And so when they come back to these to populations come back together, if they have different Wolbachia infections, it seems each Wolbachia that the other one's not infected, and so they cause sterility. And so you can get sterility coming just from the Wolbachia alone, um, leading to speciation. It's thought that Wolbachia can help influence any questions about that? Yeah. So on the last slide, is it It's the same. So for this strain, it treats Wolbachia free and Wolbachia not me as the same thing. It's a you're not you don't you don't have me in you, never have Wolbachia. Okay. Now, of course, how does it recognize self versus non self Wolbachia? Is you know it's not like an instantaneous thing. There's this um, relatedness, and so you know, if it, if there's other Wolbach, if it had a Wolbach that was close related, it would recognize it. If it's more distantly related, it's not producing the right genes, then it would treat it as not being there, right? And so that also has to change the time. Yeah. So when it's what? So right. So but. This recognizes this, this so so if I'm in a male, right? You know, is, is my mate with Wolbachia or without Wolbachia, right? And all it cares about is with Wolbachia, my Wolbachia, right? So it treats um, Wolbachia, um, Wolbachia B, as being distinct from Wolbachia A, treats the same as Wolbachia minus. If they're different enough, they recognize it as a different strain. Does that make sense? So this, ask, yeah. Right. So, so this is what about my, this is no, this is lacking Wolbachia. Oh, totally. Yeah, lacking Wolbachia. Right. So this isn't a situation where they're different strains. Right. No. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, if, if Wolbachia A and B, instead of plus and minus, then this would also produce an offspring. Okay, okay. And thus you get the speciation. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's good. Yes. Yep. The minus also means no Wolbachia. Right, but if I do a different diagram, which is what this diagram is going for, if the hundred for Bakia A and the for Bakia B, right, then um, they also to a Bakia A, it looks like A and then B or minus treated the same, and then if it's reversed, this is B and this is treated as A or minus, and also no offspring. I'll 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 create a new figure with, with A and B so you can see it easier. Okay. We're out of time, but just um, <coughs> one brief other thing that Wolbachia can do. If you only get passed on in females, if you're in a male, one thing you do is change it to be female. And that would also be advantageous when you get passed on. And so some Wolbachia can actually change males into becoming females by um, converting them. So, kind of cool. All right, I'll see you on Wednesday.